Hello students, it's Professor Bridget again. I am now going to cover part three of the connective tissue lecture. Remember during the uh, last lecture, we covered all of connective tissue proper. We looked at examples of connective tissue proper. And what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and briefly cover fluid connective tissue and have an introduction to supporting connective tissue. Mostly just cartilage, because next week when we get into the skeletal system, we'll learn a whole lot more about bone, but I'll introduce both of those to you. Now, just as a reminder, again, let's talk about those three things that all connective tissues must have. They must have ground substance, fibers, and cells. Remember that the ground substance consistency can change, the types of fibers present can change, and the types of cells present will change. And when that happens, that gives these different connective tissues different properties, different functions, and therefore you'll also find them in different locations. So that's just another reminder for you. Let's go ahead and start off with fluid connective tissue, and we're just going to cover that real briefly. So uh, blood is considered a connective tissue because it has ground substance, fibers, and cells. One of the big differences, though, with blood is the ground substance is very watery. The ground substance in blood is what we call plasma. So it's much more fluid than it would be in a connective tissue proper. There will be fibers present. The fibers present are fibrin, those fibers that are responsible for clotting. And then there will be various types of cells. At the bottom there, you can see there'll be red blood cells, obviously, in blood, a variety of white blood cells, and then parts of cells called platelets. So this is what makes blood a connective tissue. Now you might not know what lymph is. You may have heard the term before, but lymph is a fluid that travels through vessels in your body like blood. The difference here is that lymph does not flow through your blood vessels. It flows through vessels called lymphatic vessels. And lymph is kind of a clear fluid. Um, it has, uh, so the, the clear fluid would be kind of, again, this consistency of water. And it contains lymphocytes as its main cells. Remember, lymphocytes are essentially white blood cells. And you don't need to worry about the types of fibers present. What's important for you to know is that because lymph is carrying white blood cells, the lymph is important in initiating an immune response. When there is a pathogen present or cancerous cells or cellular debris, the variety of lymphocytes in that lymph can head to the site and um, help uh, repair and or phagocytize um, any of those invaders or cellular debris. So that's all I'm gonna say about fluid connective tissue. We will learn more about lymph um, as we move on in the course. And when you get to physiology and microbiology, you'll certainly learn more about blood. So now let's spend our time in this section, supporting connective tissue. One of the big differences here that you're gonna see is you're gonna see a much more solid ground substance, and very highly specialized cells. So this is almost the opposite of connective tissue proper, right? Where you had a, um, um, a gelatinous-like or more watery-like type of ground substance. You had a variety of cells and a variety of fibers. Supporting connective tissue is going to be much more highly specialized. Let's go ahead and learn just about supporting connective tissue in general. The two types are cartilage and bone. 
And with supporting connective tissue, you have much fewer cells than we've seen in other types of connective tissues. And you have much higher amounts of fibers. The fibers present can be collagen fibers, elastic fibers, or a combination of both. In some cases, like in bone, the ground substance is going to have calcium salts in it. And this is really what makes bone uh, hard. Um, you're going to have less ground substance in bone than you would in cartilage. But both cartilage and bone are going to have really high amounts of cells. And the types of cells present in cartilage and bone. In cartilage specifically, there are two main types of cells. The two types of cells that are most prominent are chondroblasts. Oops. A chondro means cartilage. And blast, as you might rec rec recall, oh, you can't see that very well. Hold on. Bear with me for a sec. Uh, blast means immature. So these are immature cartilage cells, but that doesn't mean that they are inactive. It just means that they still have the ability to differentiate into mature cells, mature cartilage cells called chondrocytes. So remember that, let me just draw a little progression for you here. I'm gonna do it up at the top. Remember that mesenchymal cells those are the kind of like the connective tissue stem cells that give rise to all other connective tissue cells. They're going to differentiate into what we call fibroblasts. And fibroblasts, as you know, are present in uh, connective tissue, but that's not the most highly specialized type of cell. Fibroblasts still have the ability to differentiate even further or become even more specific. So depending on the type of tissue, when cartilage is growing, for instance, fibroblasts will first be present, but then they differentiate into chondroblasts. And chondroblasts will eventually differentiate into chondrocytes. And the same is true for most of the cells of bone. The um, fibroblasts will differentiate first into Sorry, I'm running out of space. Osteoprogenitor cells. Osteoprogenitor cells then differentiate into osteoblasts. And osteoblasts differentiate into osteocytes. So the types of cells present really depends on um, how mature the tissue is itself. So let me tell you what uh, chondrocytes do. Or, I'm sorry, not chondrocytes, chondroblasts and osteoblasts and all these other cells. So chondroblasts, let me see, do I cover this on the next slide? I'll cover it right here. So chondroblasts are kind of like uh, fibroblasts and chondroblasts secrete what do you say? Assemble and secrete. Assemble and secrete fibers, just like fibroblasts do. Chondrocytes do not have the ability to do that. Chondrocytes really just maintain the area around them. So chondrocytes are going to maintain the ground substance um, around them but they are not going to assemble and secrete fibers. So chondroblasts are the ones that are assembling the fibers, secreting the fibers, and making the ground substance, okay? So chondrocyte is really just a mature chondroblast. Then with, uh, in bone, osteoblasts, they're going to assemble and secrete the fibers. They're going to create the ground substance. So we could kind of um, draw a square around here because they do the same things, just in different tissue types, right? So those osteoblasts are immature bone cells. 
And then those immature bone cells, those osteoblasts, differentiate into osteocytes, the mature bone cells. And osteocytes do the same thing as chondrocytes. They're just going to maintain the area around them um, in a mature bone. Osteoprogenitor cells are the precursor to osteoblasts. You don't need to know what they do, except for you need to recognize that osteoprogenitor cells are uh, going to differentiate into osteoblasts. And then lastly, this one right here, osteoclasts, they, do, they come from a completely different cell line. They do not originate from fibroblasts. These are um, essentially very large, multinucleated uh, macrophages. And what they do is um, dissolve old bone. When we get to the skeletal system, I'll talk more about those. They dissolve old or um, damaged bone. Okay, let's move ahead of myself. I'll go ahead and see this next slide here. So let's go ahead and look at cartilage specifically. The function of cartilage, or kind of like the main function of cartilage, is to provide strength, but also to provide flexibility. So cartilage isn't so uh, strong or hard that it doesn't allow for flexibility in where we find it. The location is going to vary and the structure will vary. There are a few different types of cartilage that we're going to learn about. And so on the previous slide, I was mentioning that um, primarily, at least in fully differentiated cartilage or fully grown cartilage, most of the cells there are chondrocytes. There will be some chondroblasts um, present in fully differentiated cartilage, um, but not as many as when the cartilage is young. Remember that fibroblasts give rise to those chondrocytes and, or sorry, the chondroblasts. The chondroblasts secrete the fibers and the, the ground substance. And then eventually those chondroblasts, they're going to differentiate into chondrocytes. Okay. Both of, or sorry, the chondrocytes themselves, you'll see this here in just a second, but I guess I'll attempt and draw it. Don't laugh. Um, existed little pockets called lacunae. So in blue, this is going to be a little pocket. And then I'll draw a chondrocyte on the inside. So this is the chondrocyte itself. And just for good measure, I'll draw the nucleus inside. So the blue part would be the lacuna. Lacuna is singular, lacunae is plural. And then this is the chondrocyte. So sometimes students have difficulty understanding what a lacuna is. So that's um, this little structure that we find the mature cartilage cells, the chondrocytes, in. Now there's a specific name for the ground substance that's secreted by the cells, and that's chondrin. And the um, fibers can either be collagen fibers or elastic fibers or a combination of the two. And I'll show you examples of that. One of the things we see with cartilage is that um, cartilage is surrounded by a um, connective tissue structure. So completely kind of like encapsulated by this connective tissue structure that we call perichondrium. And I'm gonna show you on the next slide what cartilage just kind of in general looks like, but what I mean by perichondrium. And that perichondrium has two layers, an inner cellular layer and an outer fibrous layer. So just as the name implies, that inner cellular layer is made of cells. So this is where you'll find chondroblasts, the cells that are still secreting ground substance and fibers. And then superficial to that, you're gonna find what we call an outer fibrous layer. And so in this outer fibrous layer, what you find are collagen fibers. I'll show you a picture in a sec. 
All cartilage is avascular, meaning there are no blood vessels in the tissue. So oftentimes in uh, science, if you see the letter A in front of a word, that means without. So avascular means without blood vessels or without vascularization. But this is living tissue. And living tissue must have some way to carry out gas exchange, bring in oxygen and nutrients, carry out carbon dioxide and waste. So this still needs to occur even though the uh, cartilage is avascular. And the way that that occurs is just via diffusion. But remember, diffusion is limited by the thickness of the um, medium. So the thicker cartilage gets, especially once it's full grown, much more difficult it is for diffusion to occur into the inside of that tissue. This is something you would have learned in your bio, um, your gen bio class. So in adults who have fully differentiated cartilage, that is at its thickest because it's fully grown, um, there is no growth or repair because those cells there, or the tissue rather, is so poorly vascularized. Now diffusion still occurs, but it's very, very, very minimal. It's just enough to keep those cells alive, but it's not enough to supply adequate uh, nutrients for growth. So if you were to tear cartilage in your shoulder, like the labrum of your shoulder or the meniscus in your knee, that's not going to repair itself, okay? Uh, the cells, those, those chondrocytes have a um, very, very, very low metabolic rate and they're just kind of eking out an, an existence because um, of, there's no vascularization and that nutrient um, exchange and gas exchange occurs just via diffusion, okay? So let's have a, um, an example of cartilage. So I'll outline the cartilage here for you, the actual um, cartilage itself. Let me point out some things to you. So here's the lacuna. And then in red, I'll just circle, that's the chondrocyte. So that's the cell itself. Okay, so that would be the, um, the bulk of the, the fully differentiated cartilage. Now, if we look around the outside, we see this layer here, and then up top, this layer here. That's the perichondrium. And that perichondrium has an inner cellular layer, as I mentioned. So um, let me use a different color here. Let's use uh, green. So here would be the inner cellular layer where you're gonna find the cells. And the cells here are osteoblasts. That's, oh, sorry, not osteoblasts, chondroblasts. Okay, so that's why we call this the inner cellular layer. This is where you'll find small amounts of chondroblasts secreting fibers. Okay, and then in the outermost layer, that's in what we call the outer fibrous layer. This is just gonna be made of fibers, okay? So you see the same thing up on the top as well. You'll have an inner cellular layer like this, and then that outer fibrous layer. So that's perichondrium. So the function of perichondrium is, yeah, to surround the connective tissue and protect it, but it's also to anchor the cartilage to whatever it's bound to. So let's say at the ends of your long bones, like your um, humerus, your upper arm bone, for example, all your long bones have cartilage at both ends. Think of uh, the last time perhaps maybe you ate a chicken drumstick and if you're um, one of those people who like to suck all the meat off, you'll see that at the ends of that chicken drumstick, that's a femur, right? At the ends of that, you will um, see kind of the shiny, um, almost uh, shiny, uh, almost looks like bone, but it's shiny. That's hyaline cartilage. 
And that cartilage isn't just like stuck to the bone itself, just kind of magically. It's anchored to the bone. It's actually woven into the bone. When we get to bone, I'll explain this more. But the way that this perichondrium anchors the cartilage to the bone is through this fibrous layer. Bone is going to have something very similar surrounding it that we call periosteum. So imagine there being fibers here in this outer layer of the perichondrium. And then imagine of the periosteum, the covering around bone, also has its fibers. So the fibers of the bone and the fibers of the cartilage weave together to create this nice tight connection. So that's one of the other functions of perichondrium, along with surrounding and supporting and protecting the cartilage, it anchors cartilage to surrounding structures. So here now we see the three main types of cartilage. There are There is what we call hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. The, um, on the very left, those pictures are drawings. On the very right, those are uh, micrographs, images of actual cartilage underneath the microscope. And if you take a close look, you can pretty easily and quickly see that each cartilage looks different. It has a different structure. And remember that relationship between structure and function that variations in structure lead to variations in function which then also leads to variations in location. So let's look at hyaline cartilage first. So H-Y-A-L means uh, glossy or smooth. And the reason for uh, giving this cartilage its name is because the ground substance and fibers are all of this pink that you see here in the background, right? And so you might be saying, well, Bridget, where are the fibers? I can't see the fibers. This type of cartilage has um, a type of collagen fiber that doesn't pick up stain very easily. And so you, you're unable to see the individual collagen fibers, but they are there. So when scientists first looked at this cartilage underneath the, underneath the microscope, they said, whoa, hold on a second. Uh, we don't see the fibers. This looks really glassy. And they named it hyaline cartilage. The um, hyaline cartilage, uh, so that's ground substance and fibers, that's there, right? And then the cells are going to be chondroblasts and chondrocytes. But remember, the only place you'll find the chondroblasts is in the perichondria. The chondrocytes are, let me see if I can zoom in on this right here. Here we go. Okay, so the chondrocytes are gonna be these little dark dots that you see. And the little pocket around them, you guys can say it with me, that little pocket starts with an L. That little pocket right there is called a lacuna. Lacunae is plural. One of the distinguishing features of hyaline cartilage is that you see the uh, chondrocytes kind of packed on top of each other, kind of stacked together like poker chips. And um, you don't necessarily see that with like elastic cartilage and fibrocartilage. So that's the structure of hyaline uh, cartilage. And again, its function, like the other cartilages as well, is that it's both tough, tough and flexible. The fibers there are only collagen fibers. So that's what gives it its toughness. Where we find it? At the ends of, um, let's say at the ends of long bones. So your upper arm, your lower arm bones, your upper leg, your lower legs, all those bones are what we call long bones. You find it around the trachea or what you might call your windpipe. So you find these rings around your trachea. Go ahead right now and take your finger and uh, rub it up and down your throat and you can feel those ridges in your throat or, <clears throat> or on your trachea rather, or the area you would call your throat. Those ridges or those little bumps that you feel in there, those are um, hyaline cartilage rings. And you also find it connecting the ribs to the sternum. Take a deep breath. 
So as you take that deep breath, you can feel your, your rib cage rising and your ribs are anchored to your sternum. So the hyaline, there's hyaline cartilage that connects your ribs to your sternum and that's what provides the flexibility for your rib cage to rise up off of your lungs as you take that breath in. If the ribs, which are bone, connect directly to the sternum by bone, then there would be no flexibility and you wouldn't be able to um, inflate your lungs like you're able to do now. The um, rib cage would not elevate. You would not be able to, to, um, to inflate your lungs. <clears throat> and then secondly, let's go ahead and look at elastic cartilage. And as the name implies, elastic cartilage is going to have not collagen fibers, but elastic fibers. So think about how having a different type of fiber is going to affect the function of this tissue. Elastic fibers, remember, aren't as strong as collagen fibers, but they are stretchy. So you can kind of uh, pull on them like rubber bands, and when you let go, they will go back to their original resting shape. So elastic cartilage is much more flexible than hyaline cartilage, but it's still strong. Not as strong as hyaline cartilage, but it's still strong. Uh, you'll find elastic cartilage in your outer ear, so um, where you tug on your earlobe, and then also on what's called the epiglottis. This is like a little lid that covers your windpipe, your trachea, while you're swallowing food and drink. Let's have a look at the elastic cartilage. So the fibers, yellow is not a good color, let's do red. The fibers are these little string-like structures that are purple. And the uh, lacunae are here, that little pocket. And then inside, you can see the chondrocyte, that little purple dot, right? And then in the background, in pink, or what I'll just kind of sh shade here in yellow, that would be the ground substance, the chondrin. So there you have it, all three components of connective tissue, ground substance, fibers, and cells. One of the other things you see here um, is that the chondrocytes aren't stacked on top of each other, they're a little bit more independent from one another. So that's different than what we see in hyaline cartilage. And then lastly, uh, fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is made of collagen fibers as well, but the collagen fibers have a different conformation, a different structure than the collagen fibers that we find in hyaline cartilage. So here you can actually see the fibers. So um, this time I will use yellow. These little squiggly lines, all of those are the collagen fibers, right? And then um, here would be the chondrocyte, and the lacuna would be this little pocket around it. And that black dot in the center, that would be the nucleus. So in this type of cartilage, it's meant to, because the hyaline, or sorry, the collagen fibers have a different conformation, this type of cartilage is really good at resisting compression. So it doesn't, you can't squeeze it very well. Rather, these fibers absorb shock. So they absorb energy, essentially. You find uh, fibrocartilage pads, what you might call a disc, between the vertebrae in the, of the bones, uh, the vertebrae of your back, or the bones of your back. So um, these are these little, um, those are the little pads between the hard uh, vertebrae. You also find a piece of fibrocartilage anchoring the right side of your pelvis to the left side of your pelvis anteriorly. So um, in the front of your pelvis anteriorly, there's a piece of fibrocartilage that um, holds the two sides of your pelvis together. That's something I'll revisit also when we get to the skeletal system. So there you have it, the three types of cartilage, their structures, functions, 
and locations. Now it's your job to go to the histologyguide.com website, have a look at these cartilages under various magnifications, and identify the structures that um, are listed in your handout <clears throat> for your first exam. I'll put pictures up of these three cartilages and I will ask you questions about, one could just be identify. Identify the type of cartilage you see here. Or I could ask you to identify a structure like a chondrocyte or a lacuna or a fiber. I could also ask you to identify the function of that particular cartilage or ask you to give me one example of where you find it. So again, keep in mind, structure, function, location are the things that you want to remember about whatever it is you're studying in anatomy. Let's move on now to a different type of connective tissue. It's kind of a shift in gears a little bit, and this is fascia. So fascia is, um, it's connective tissue, right? Uh, layers of connective tissue that connect organs within the body cavity or within body cavities to the rest of the body. So it's really connective tissue that's uh, connecting everything to everything else. It, just like other connective tissues, it provides strength and um, stability, and it helps maintain uh, the position of your internal organs inside of your body. It ensures that those internal organs are either suspended or anchored in place and not uh, falling down and jiggling around um, inside your body cavities. Fascia also uh, provides anchorage or a route for blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. Blood vessels and lymphatic vessels are going to be anchored to surrounding structures via fascia, via this connective tissue. So there are three main types of fascia. There's superficial fascia, and you find that between the skin and your underlying organs, so that would be like between skin and muscle. I'll show you an example in a second. Deep fascia, which makes up um, capsules, like uh, capsules around your joints, like a knee capsule. Uh, you also find deep fascia uh, making up uh, ligaments and tendons. That's technically how it's, um, the ligaments and tendons are classified as being deep fascia. And then also something that we call subserous fascia. So sub means below. And in this case, it's referring to um, the connective tissue that we find between serous membranes and deep fascia. If you don't remember what serous membranes are, uh, definitely go back and revisit those. Those are membranes that secrete a slippery, uh, oily fluid. Have a look at where we find superficial fascia. So let me change the color on my pen because yellow looks horrible. So here would be the skin, just this little, just this little layer right here, right? Oops, that layer right here. And then immediately deep to that, and I'm gonna see if I can highlight that instead. I'm gonna highlight that in green. Immediately deep to that is superficial fascia. And that's primarily gonna be made up of um, adipose tissue and areolar connective tissue. So that's superficial, right? It's the most superficial type of fascia. And then here's a, um, oops, the next picture. And then here's an example of where you might find some of the deep fascia, not all, but here's, um, here are examples of deep fascia. So let me get the highlighter out again. Here would be superficial fascia in green. And then in red, that's muscle. And then that bluish grayish line in between, that is deep fascia or one example of deep fascia. You see it's anchoring the skin to underlying muscles or like in this case, let me change my pen. In this case, here's one layer of muscle right here. And then you see a very different layer deep to that. Deep fascia can also anchor one muscle to the next. So that gray line right there is uh, the deep fascia anchoring those two muscles together. 
So that's all I have. That is the the remaining information for um, the connective tissue lecture, the end um, of all the connective tissue information that you need to know for your exam on connective tissue. Okay, thanks for listening.